For centuries, the messianic hopes and prayers of the Jewish people have been focused on this wall and a temple that used to rise above its massive stones. Michael Rydelnik, whose parents were Holocaust survivors, first came to this wall at age 10. Since then, Dr. Rydelnik has returned many times, this time to reflect on his personal search for the Messiah of the Bible. My search for Messiah on this day of discovery. This is the land of the Bible, modern Israel, with ancient limestone walls framing the old city of Jerusalem. This city has been the focal point of the Jewish people for thousands of years. Central to the Jewish faith is the hope for a Messiah, a hope that Messiah will come to bring peace and prosperity for all nations. Dr. Michael Rydelnik grew up in a home that was held together by Jewish traditions, family traditions that included a shared belief in a long-awaited Messiah. Then one day, Michael's mother revealed a shocking personal secret, a secret that would compel Michael to begin his search for the Messiah of Israel. The first time I came to this place, the Western Wall, I was 10 years old. It was 1968 just shortly after Israel had united the city of Jerusalem and taken back the holiest site in Judaism, the Western Wall. My family brought me here to see this wonderful place and to pray here. It was because it was a great time of excitement, expectation. For so many centuries, Jewish people had longed for, wanted, expected the Messiah. And now perhaps with the reunited city, we would see him come. We would see him shortly arrive and deliver his people and end the exile of our people. As I thought about messianic expectation, it was the first time in my life that I really thought that perhaps in my life I would see the coming of the Messiah. I remember praying here at the wall as a boy. And every time I've come back, I so identify. People are praying here for their families, for their children, for their parents, for their people. They're praying for the Messiah to come. And sometimes the prayers are so intense. I understand that uh, my parents were survivors of the Holocaust and it was so meaningful to be here, to pray with them as a young boy. I suppose the, the biggest surprise of my life was when my mom told me as a freshman in high school that she secretly had believed in Jesus S since she was a teenager, since she had been hidden from the Nazis, since she had gone to concentration camp, she had always believed in him and never told us. When she went public with this, as you can imagine, my dad, who was orthodox and uh, very angry about what Christians had done, he said, you can't be Jewish and believe this. And he insisted that she abandon her faith. And he threatened her. He said, if you don't stop this, this foolishness, I'm going to leave you. My mom said she couldn't give it up. She was so sure that Jesus was the, the Jewish Messiah. And so my dad did indeed leave her. He divorced her and came to live here in Israel. Well, if he was angry, so was I, because she had custody of me. I was a freshman in high school, and I, I was flabbergasted that my mother would believe in Jesus. We had always divided the world up into us and them, and now my mother was saying she was one of them. How could she believe in Jesus? How could she betray her people this way? How could she betray her family? How could she betray me this way? I was really angry about it. And because of that, uh, I began to argue with her. And as we argued about it in scripture, we'd look at Bible verses, and I thought she just didn't know what she was talking about. Everyone knew that there was no peace on earth. How could Jesus be the Messiah? She knew better than that. I thought, how am I going to get her to stop believing this? It seemed to me that she had 
fallen in with the wrong group of people. She was in a Bible study with another woman and uh, various other middle-aged women like herself, and they were all studying the Bible. I thought, the way I can get her out of this is if I would meet with this Bible teacher of hers and prove this woman wrong. Show her that Jesus did not fulfill these prophecies. Show my mom this. And then my mom would leave this foolishness that had ruined our family. So I actually did begin to study the scriptures. I began to study what the scriptures have to say about the Messiah. What would he be like? When would he be born? Where would he come from? And because of that, I was shocked to see what the scriptures have to say what they really do say about who the Messiah would be and when he would come. So we decided to meet Hilda Kozer and I on a regular basis. She had an office and a center and something not too far from my high school and uh, a place where we would go and sit in a kitchen and open the scriptures and study them together. I thought she was a little overconfident myself. I thought she seemed so sure that Jesus was the Messiah and I thought she can't be right. How could this Jewish woman claim that Jesus was the Messiah? I'll show her. Well, we started talking about where the Messiah would be born. And so we began with Micah 5 where it says, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though you are little among all the tribes of Judah, out of you will come forth one who will be ruler over all Israel whose goings forth are from old, even from everlasting. Well, we started looking at this passage and I really didn't have that much trouble with it because it said he would come from Bethlehem, the city of David. Well, I believe that the Messiah would be the son of David and he could be born in Bethlehem. In fact, Bethlehem was in his Israelite hands right now, Israeli hands. And so, of course, we, uh, we felt sure uh, the Messiah could be born in Bethlehem, no problem. And it even specified which Bethlehem, Bethlehem Ephrata, because Bethlehem Ephrata is in contrast to the Bethlehem in the north of Israel. So I really didn't have too much trouble with this verse, but then I was kind of shaken up when Hilda began to show me in this, this verse that it said he would come from eternity. He wouldn't just be born, he was from eternity past. His goings forth are from old, even from everlasting. This was shocking to me. The Messiah wasn't going to be just like one of us, which is what I had been taught, just a regular person, but rather an eternal being who would come and be the ruler over all Israel. I said, I'm not sure that that's what that verse means. And she always challenged me. So well, what does it mean? And I said, maybe he just comes from a long time ago, that he's been waiting for a long time to, to appear, to make his presence known. She said, it seems to be saying that he'll be born in Bethlehem, but that his real coming is from eternity. Well, I kind of put that in the box and filed it and thought, I'll think about that, but I'm not so sure about what it means. Well, Hilda had convinced me that Messiah was supposed to be born in Bethlehem. That wasn't so hard because it was Bethlehem, Jewish city, we understood that. But then she began to talk about when the Messiah was supposed to come. And I said, no one knows when the Messiah is supposed to come. It's clear that the rabbis taught us that we're never supposed to calculate or anticipate exactly when he's supposed to come. And she said, but what if we missed him? What if he should have been here already and we missed him? And I said, no, no, we couldn't miss him. We'd know it if he had come. And she said, well, let's look at what the scriptures say. And she pointed me to a passage that I knew that our, our sages for centuries had said was a passage about the Messiah. It said, the scepter won't depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Well, it was clear that this was about the Messiah, but it was enigmatic, I said. It was hard to understand. How do you know what this means? And she said, listen carefully to what the words say and we began to study. The first thing she talked about was the scepter. And I said, a scepter is what a king has in his hand. And she said, yes, but the Hebrew word is different. We looked at the Hebrew word and it was true. It, it meant a stick and it could be used of all kinds of sticks, sometimes for a king's scepter. But even in that passage, 
it refers sometimes to a tribal staff. The staff that each tribe had to identify itself. Sort of like uh, what a, a, a Scotsman would have with his coat of arms today. She said, this, this refers to the tribal staff, what identified Judah as Judah. And she said, and the ruler staff has to do with the authority to rule, to judge. And she said, this verse is saying that Judah won't lose its identity as a tribe and the Jewish people won't lose their right to rule, to judge until Shiloh, the Messiah, comes. And when he does, all peoples will worship him and obey him. And then she asked me, real pointedly, when did Judah lose its tribal identity? Of course, no one knows who's from Judah today. Since the destruction of the temple, all the records were lost. We don't know who's from Judah. Judah lost tribal identity in 70 when the temple was destroyed. And when did we lose judicial, judicial authority? When did we lose that? And I thought about it. And the Talmud says that 40 years before the destruction of the temple, we lost our right in capital punishment. Well, actually, historically, we know that it happened even earlier. But it was saying that sometime in the first century, we lost the right to judge capital cases. Messiah should have come. Shiloh should have come before the destruction of the temple so we would know who came from Judah. Messiah should have come before we lost the right of capital punishment when we could try capital cases. Messiah should have been here by the first century if this verse were true. I said, I don't think that's what this verse means. And she challenged me, she said, well, what does it mean? I said, I don't know. I'll need more research, but it can't mean that because if Messiah had come by the first century, we would have known. One of the toughest verses that uh, Jewish people face all the time is the verse in Isaiah 7, 14. It says, Behold, the Lord himself will give you a sign. A virgin will conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. This is so disputed because it is argued that the word is not virgin, but young woman. And it has nothing to do with the virgin birth. And yet that's how often how it is often quoted. Well, when I encountered that verse the first time, I was ready. I knew it didn't mean virgin. I knew it meant young woman. And when Hilda Kozer showed it to me, I said, no, 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 no. We've studied this one. The word means young woman. There's another word in Hebrew that means virgin, and it's not used here. And she said, okay, but let's look up every reference to this word in the Hebrew Bible and show me one place where it refers to someone who is not a virgin. We started going through passage by passage by passage, and there is no other place where it refers to a, a young woman who is not a virgin. In fact, it's used as a synonym for, for a virgin in Genesis 24. I said, nevertheless, it may refer to a virgin or a young woman, but it's not about the virgin birth of the Messiah. You cannot convince me it's about something that happened in Isaiah's day. And I kind of left it there. Through the years, I studied it and pondered it. And now I kind of have a different perspective as I look at it. As I read this passage, it's clear that Isaiah was supposed to bring his son, Sha'ar Yashuv, to meet King Ahaz and give him hope as there was a threat to the throne of David. And the threat to the throne of David mean there was a threat to the messianic hope because the Messiah was to come from David. And then he was to ask for a sign. Ahaz the king was to ask for a sign as high as heaven or as deep as Sheol. It didn't matter. Ask for anything to show the Lord would protect him. Ahaz, a, a wicked king, refuses the offer. He says, no, I, I don't want to tempt the Lord. And he feigns false piety. And then, amazingly, the Hebrew is very clear. Isaiah turns from Ahaz and addresses the entire house of David and says, well, if he won't ask for a sign, the Lord himself will give the whole house of David, you, plural, all of you, a sign that the house of David is secure, that the messianic hope is secure. You'll know this when the virgin, the pregnant virgin, literally what the Hebrew says, 
gives birth to a son who will be God with us, Emmanuel. And then this child will grow up under oppression. And you'll know that the Lord has delivered the house of David. Well, as I've studied this passage, it is so clear that it is a reference to the hope of David, the son of David, who would come and be born of a virgin. Later verses return back to another child, Sha'ar Yeshuv, I like to call him old Schleppalong, because Isaiah had to bring him along. And before that child would reach a certain age, then the threat on Judah in that day would be gone. But the real hope of this passage in verses 13 through 15 is about the coming of the Messiah, that the son of David would indeed come, the throne of David was secure, and that the Messiah would be born and we'd know it because he would be born of a virgin. This wall behind me stood in the days of Isaiah. Isaiah the prophet walked along here and gave his message to Judah, proclaimed the words of God to his people. Amazing when you think about it that we have those words today. And when I was a teenager and studying with Hilda Koza, she brought me to one of Isaiah's major prophecies of the Messiah. And we looked at it and it shocked me. I used to contend that those who believed in Jesus confused the passages. They said that Jesus was the Messiah and God. And of course, we knew that the Messiah was not supposed to be God. And Hilda Kozer opened to Isaiah 9, 6 and had me read, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Father of Eternity, Prince of Peace. I still remember looking at this verse and Hilda looking at me and saying, now, this is saying the Messiah will be born, right? And I said, yes, unto us a son is born, unto us a child is given. And then she says, look at his names, look at his titles. Now, of course, you might call the child Wonderful Counselor. I agreed. You might call a child Wonderful, and when he grows up, he might be Counselor. But to call a child Mighty God, the Father of Eternity, that means the author of time, and the Prince of Peace, those are words that are not reserved for an ordinary child. Those are throne titles that reflect the nature of this child. And this child that would be born, the child that is the Messiah, he would also be God in the flesh. I was shocked. I said, this is just one long Hebrew name. That's how my Bible reads it, I said. And she said, yes, but what do those words mean? I couldn't accept it, but I was shocked. And I began to ask God, is it possible that they're right? Is it possible that this is about the Messiah and that he's God in the flesh? If you were to ask me when I was a young man, what is the job of the Messiah? What is his role? What will he do with his life? Probably the only thing I could have told you is that he would bring peace. And that was exactly what I said to Hilda Kozer, that we know who the Messiah will be, because he'll be the peacemaker. He'll be the one who brings peace. And she said, there's more to the Messiah than just being a peacemaker. And she turned to Isaiah 35, five and six. And there it says that the eyes of the blind will be open and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped and the lame will leap like a deer, that the tongue of the dumb will shout for joy. What a glorious picture of what it would be like in the Messianic age. The Messiah would be far more, I realized, than a, than a peacemaker. He would be one that would do all sorts of miracles when he came. And as I studied this with Hilda Kozer, she showed me how in the scriptures it was to be that the Messiah would be a miracle worker. And I knew this really from rabbinic literature. The rabbinic literature had said that as was the first redeemer, so would be the second redeemer. The first redeemer was Moses who had done many, many miracles. And so the second redeemer would do the many, many miracles as well. Yes, the Messiah was supposed to be a miracle worker, I realized. What bothered me is how did I know if Jesus indeed had been a miracle worker? And what struck me all of a sudden was that in some rabbinic tradition, it was said that Jesus of Nazareth had been a magician 
and that he had done things by saying the divine name. And all of a sudden it, put toge it came together for me because I realized that there was some tradition of Jesus doing miracles. Yes, it was sort of poo-pooed as being a magician, but he had done miracles. And so now I was distressed because he seemed to fit the bill of the miracle worker described in Isaiah 35. And the Messiah wasn't just supposed to be a miracle worker. He was supposed to also be a teacher, according to Isaiah, a preacher. In Isaiah 61.1, it says that the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to bind up the brokenhearted, and to preach the favorable year of the Lord. In this verse, it's speaking of the day of the Messiah's coming, and he would teach the people and preach God's word to them and announce liberty and peace and comfort. I was very, very surprised as I saw this because it was a much broader picture of the Messiah than I had ever anticipated. He was, yes, to be a king who would bring peace, I knew that, but he was to be so much more, a miracle worker, a proclaimer of peace and comfort. I needed to study more. Why didn't I know all this about the Messiah? I need to learn who he really was. After weeks of studying Messianic passages with Hilda Koser, one day she said to me, how would you recognize the Messiah if he had come? I said, I still didn't know. I just wasn't sure. I, I knew it couldn't be Jesus, but I don't know. She said, well, let's think about what we've seen. We've seen that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. And in Matthew, it says that the Messiah indeed was born in Bethlehem. Yeshua had come and been born there. And then she said, and we, we looked at Genesis 49, which speaks of Messiah coming by the first century. And in Galatians, it says that the Messiah came in the fullness of time. In Galatians 4.4, 4, Paul wrote that. And we know that Yeshua had come by the first century. And we also saw that the Messiah would be born of a virgin as a sign to Israel. And of course, in the Gospels, it speaks of Messiah's virgin birth. Yeshua had come and been born of a virgin. Not only that, but we had looked at the Messiah's nature, that he wasn't just going to be like any other man, but he would have the titles of deity. In Isaiah 9, 6, it had said that he would be wonderful counselor, mighty God, father of eternity, and prince of peace. And we see in the new covenant that it is said that he was born God, that he was the word of God, that he was God. And then we look in the New Testament, we see just as Isaiah had foretold, just as he would be, a, that he would be a miracle worker. And in the Gospels it shows that Yeshua had indeed done miracles and opened the eyes of the blind and made the deaf to hear and made the lame to walk. And then he had come and he had proclaimed the good news, just as Isaiah had said, the good news to the brokenhearted. Well, I said, yeah, I just don't know. I'm just not sure. I don't know what to think. And she said, well, here's what I would suggest you do. She challenged me to pray and to ask God, show me if Jesus is the Messiah. And I thought about that for a moment and I said, no, no, I really don't need to do that. Uh, he's not the Messiah. I don't need to pray about it. You need to pray about it. And we kind of left it at that. And then that night for the first time, as I was laying in bed and thinking about this conversation, I got up the nerve and I thought, God, I know that Jesus can't be the Messiah. It's impossible that we have missed him all these years. But if indeed this Yeshua, this Yeshua of Nazareth is the Messiah, show me, I can't believe it's true, but show me if it really is true. And I prayed that prayer and decided never to tell anyone, fully expecting that God would never show me anything else as I thought about these passages.